I hope you've all been enjoying the Smithsonian National Education Summit thus far. I'm delighted to provide a Smithsonian welcome to today's panelists for the session, Lessons and the Land, How a Sense of Place Creates Pur Purposeful Learning. This session includes four state teachers of the year, representing Arizona, Hawaii, Washington State, and Colorado. These exemplary teachers will share how they incorporate a sense of place with the land into their lessons and how this impacts student growth. Our moderator for today's session will be 2020 Arizona State Teacher of the Year, Lynette Stamp. She is joined by 2022 Hawaii State Teacher of the Year, Whitney Aragaki. 2022 Washington State Teacher of the Year, Jared Kipp, and 2022 Colorado State Teacher of the Year, Autumn Rivera. Throughout this session, they will share their expertise and insights on how a sense of place can elicit powerful lessons for our students. Please welcome our panelists. And I pass the baton over to Lynette. Good morning, everybody. Yes, Ash, A. Lynette Stant, Yin Shias, Sinja Kin, and Shlank, but Dadney Bashish Chin, Sitna Jini Desha Che, Koda Jini Desha Mela, Akut A. Gadane, Asan, and Shlank. Good gosh. Good morning, everybody. I am so honored and glad to be here uh, with this amazing panel, Whitney, Jared, and Autumn. Uh, welcome to the stage. I am coming to you from the ancestral lands of the Tohono O'odham Pipash and Hohokam people in Maricopa, which is located here in Arizona. So uh, to get started today, we are talking about land and our connection to land and how we bring those lessons into the classroom. So let's begin our session by talking about where we call home. Where do you call home, Gerard? Well, that that's a really complicated question. Um, I was born and raised in Washington State, and I live and work on the beautiful traditional lands of the Nisqually people. And my ancestral and spiritual home is in a beautiful spot of the earth in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas, about an hour and a half east of Selma, California. Thank you, Gerard. Adam, where do you call home? Um, I come from Glenwood Springs, Colorado. I am the third generation that has lived in this area, um, home of the Ute uh, Native tribe, and have been part of this awesome place in Colorado my entire life. And I just really enjoyed um, growing up in the same area as my father and where my grandfather came when he was 15. And so it's a place that we have deep roots in our community. Thank you, Adam. Whitney, where do you call home? Aloha, Elenet. Mahalo for the opportunity to be here. Um, I call home Hawaii. It is the traditional homelands of the Kanaka Maoli and Kanaka Oivi, who <clears throat> are where on January 17th, 1893, under gunpoint, Queen Liliuokalani Kalani temporarily yielded authority to the U.S. government to save her people. I am Gose, which honors the fifth generation of Japanese settlers in Hawaii. And so that I recognize the sense of um, impermanence of space and place, but also recognizing that the Hawaii in which my ancestors docked in the late 1800s is a far cry from the land that myself and my keiki, my children, experience on a daily level. But Hawaii is my home, and I honor all the many generations of stewards of this land. Thank you so much, Whitney. Aloha as well. Um, uh, my husband is uh, from Hawaii, and so uh, he, he, so I, I, it's, it's always wonderful to hear um, uh, the Hawaiian language. Spoken. Um, okay, so, you know, I grew up in northern Arizona. Um, my dad is originally from New Mexico, and my connection to land is deeply rooted in my culture. Uh, my grandmother, paternal uh, grandmother, did not speak English, 
and um, grew up. My dad was born in a Hogan on the Navajo reservation and his first language was Navajo. So my connection to land is, is um, deeply rooted in culture. And so, you know, that connects me. Every time I go home, that's, that's how I connect myself to who I am as a, a Diné woman. So when we think about land, what is your connection? What is your um, story, um, your land connection story? Maybe let's start with you. <clears throat> Sorry, is that me? Yeah. <laughs> Holy was like, what? Um, <laughs> Sorry. We are. Good morning, everyone. It's 8 a.m. in Hawaii, so still waking up. But of course, um, my land connection story is uh, just that of that of experience and of deep observation. I um, I think back to every single memory, a core memory that I have, and I am so appreciative of my parents who put me in on within Aina or land, um, whether it was in Hawaii, in Hilo, in our Ahupua'a, or all these different places of the world, it's an engagement in true observation that I learn who I am from where I am. I am able to make connections with my community because of my connection to the physical attributes of land, but also the cultural resources that have blossomed and have been developed because of generations, experiences, and storytelling with land. Thank you, Whitney. Um, Gerard, how, how, what is your land story connection? Um. Well, I think it comes from, I got a couple of different approaches to it. Um, I think one of my, my earliest moments of, I think, realizing the spiritual connection to land um, actually came from my father. And I remember being old enough to go hunting and waking up at dark and walking through the forest and just being present and aware and gentle and with it and finding these beautiful places to settle down and watch the sun rise over just beautiful, vast expanses. And it never seemed to fail that, you know, the, you know, all of our, our four-legged ancestors seem to know, um, when it was the day before opening season and they would walk almost within arm's reach of us. And to me, that was always a, a powerful moment of being in community and in reciprocity and presence with the land. On my mom's side, I always remember that we gathered in place. Um, it wasn't always so much that we're going to go see somebody, but we're going to go to a place to be with them. So land was always a guest or we were a guest on the land. And I also think critically too, that my land connection story is as a native person, I am, I am the land and the land is me. And we're made up of the, the same chemicals and minerals. And we, we come from it, the, our animal relations formed us from the earth. And then when we, when we, leave this this world for the spirit world then we just transform and that same energy uh continues on so it's a it's a forever connection that we have to place and to land thank you that is so beautifully put thank you um autumn um, I just love what Whitney and Jared have said about just recognizing 
where we come from and, and grounding us in that place. Um, my family is also is from uh, northern New Mexico and to come to Colorado. And I just find connection in the sagebrush and in the juniper in the pinon. All of that just really grounds me. And I feel very connected to, to the water, to the Colorado River that flows through my town that brings so much life to so many people in our arid west and finding that connection and to, in that peace just when I'm allowed to be on the water. I think because it's such a rare thing in Colorado, every chance you get to really just experience water, experience rain, experience the river is just a powerful moment. And so being able to have those moments along the water is something that I find really peaceful and really grounding. It also reminds me of my home and of my, my parents who met as raft guides. And so just having that connection to family um, is something that I truly uh, find special. And also just being able, uh, as, as Jared said, my family also gathers on my mom's side and we always gather by a body of water. And so that water piece, I think is something that's really important and is that invisible string that travels throughout every part of my life. Thank you so much. Those are all beautiful reflections. And, you know, when I think about my traditional homeland, when it, and I said earlier, it connects me to my culture. And so I live here in central Phoenix. And so there's buildings all around me. And um, as a Navajo woman, you know, I, I was taught early to go outside and, and we offer our cornmeal or corn pollen to the east where the rising sun. And so when I go home, there are no obstructions. And I find that really peaceful. Like I can um, put out my corn pollen um, and there's no buildings in front of me. Whereas here, I can't necessarily do that because there's a building right next to me and you know there's a parking lot here. And so, um, you know, it, it, it definitely, the way I pray in my own traditional um, culture is hindered um, by what I see outside. And so definitely when I go home, I, I, it's, a, it's a whole different sense of grounding. It's a whole different uh, way of practicing uh, uh, my culture. And so, and it, and it really is the environment in which I, I, I move around in. And when I think about my classroom, my students are also a reflection of their land. Um, I said, I teach on the Salt River Indian Reservation, which is a farming community. And so there's farms all around. And, and I love uh, driving into Salt River because it is it mirrors back to me what my own community is uh, where I grew up. So thinking about um, our connection with land, what are your practices and what are your reflections that help you connect with your ancestral land every day, uh, whether you're living there or whether, or whether not you're living there? Autumn, let's start with you. Yeah, I think uh, it's really important to have those connections as someone who has lived in the same area as many of my ancestors. I think having that peace, having that um, reflection piece, grounding yourself, I, I find that with my students as well, whether they just moved in here or whether they're similar to me and have lived here for many generations, we all can find connection in this place. And so I always try to make sure I find time to really have my students get to know the area around us, to get to know where they fit in in this piece, because all are welcome and all are part of it, because it, it is all of us working together to help protect it. And so finding ways to have our students engage with that, finding ways for me to engage, all of those I think are really important to allow students to really have that experience. And that might mean taking them out to the river so they can see the Colorado River or rafting on it so they get that experience, taking them hiking or on overnight trips. All of those pieces allow my students to have one more closer connection with the, the land on which they're living, which I think is something that is really powerful for them. Uh, thank you, Autumn. Jared? Yeah, Lynette, what you said got me thinking, and I, I think it's important for us to recognize, and Whitney hit on this too a little bit. I, I think it's, when we talk about uh, practices to reconnect with the land, I think it's important to recognize all of us who have been or remain dispossessed um, and whose homelands are occupied. Um, I, I was, you know, listening to, um, some previous talks like of other California native cultural leaders and culture bearers 
and everyone has trespassing stories in order to keep the culture going like everything's privately owned whole organizations have found you know have built up to try to preserve cultural ways because settlers were paving everything so we were losing access to the the materials to practice our culture to engage in our ceremonies and over 70 percent of native people are urban which implies disp dispossession and a disconnection to the places that we're from and the places that we're of so it's difficult and i think kind of like what autumn was hitting on is it's important to provide opportunities for students to connect in any way possible. Um, because, you know, we can bring those teachings, we can bring our, our plant and animal relations into class to share their knowledge and to share that community with us. And so it, it's sometimes we have to be pretty creative in an industrial settler world to maintain our traditions and to make sure that those traditions and practices continue in the future. But how, how I do it every day, it's just like, I have an opportunity to sit outside and be on a Zoom call. So I try to find these little ways to stay physically grounded to the earth. Um, and I always keep some of my land with me. Um, it keeps me true, it keeps me connected, and it gives me strength whenever I need it. That was beautiful, Jared. I was, I was thinking about how, um, the landscape that we are in, in individually, whether it's in Hawaii or, or Washington or in Colorado or wherever we are um, on uh, Turtle Island, our students are a reflection of their land. And so when they walk into our classrooms as educators, how are we honoring that with those students? Um, so Whitney, how, how what reflections and what practices help you stay connected to um, your land? There are a lot. And I think that when I, when I listen to what Jared has said and Autumn, like, absolutely. We want to make sure that our daily practices are grounded in um, a praxis of the land that we are engaging as if, as if, as we are, I know, that th we are representations of different aspects of Aina. And something that, you know, Jared was explaining that I do in class quite often is bring back this idea of what is the counter story and what is the story that has been covered by colonization within land. Like just going, just going down in one, one space of, our town. Like, okay, so there's a building there, yes. But what was there before? Oh, so there was a different building before. And before that, it was someone's home. Like, even when I take my own children to Bayfront, Hilo Bay, and I say, like, that's where your grandfather's house was before the tsunami took it away. That's, that's already going back 50, 70 years. But then thinking about whose land was that before, who lived there before, what cultures, what practices happened there before, is something that we can all do and we can do in any content area. In science, quite honestly, science has been manifested to be colonized, that many of our practices and many of our conversations are around this idea of innovation. But innovation, has always been persistent on land. Whatever indigenous community has worked on land has demonstrated um, an aspect of innovation. Um, something that really hit me recently is that I was doing some digging work of our own standards. You know, like we're just talking about standards. I was digging back to our own standards in science. And as more, as recent as I think 2001, Hawaii State Content Performance Standards for Science had a standard called Malama Ika Aina. Malama Ika Aina, there was Olelo Hawaii within our standards for science. I can't even imagine what NGSS would look like if there was indigenous representation within the standard itself. However, Hawaii removed that standard. It replaced it with sustainability and interdependence. The lack of rigor 
between malama ika aina or a definition of to take care of the land, but the the subtext of how do you take care of land knowing that there is limited resources, knowing that there is human experience on this land, is a far cry from what sustainability says today in our textbooks or in our in our work that how do we how do human systems engage with the environment? The lack of rigor, because we've removed the cultural context, disengages us from our land and disengages us from deep thinking. So forevermore, I continue to think about the counter story and what story is not being told in our educational system, in our standards, and in our classrooms. Wow, Whitney. Definitely. And and this leads me into my next question, which is, as an educator, what is our responsibility to ensure the stewards of Turtle Island is not just a regurgitation of textbooks or standards? Like, what is our responsibility as ed educators? I know that's a big question, um, but but it's an important question because we are all stewards of this land, whether whether you're indigenous or not, we are all stewards of this land. And right now, um, there are some big issues happening in indigenous country regarding surrounded regarding water, regarding um, like Moana Kea. I mean, all all of those things are big issues, and they impact um, not just the indigenous people of those communities, but the greater community at large. And so what is our responsibility as an educator to ensure um, that it's that we're just not regurgitating what's found in a textbook or, or state standards? Um, Autumn. I think it's such a great question. And I, I think, especially as, as a science teacher, so many times you can just have it be a regurgitation of the textbook. And I really try to challenge in my classroom for my students to find connection now and find connection in what's occurring around them at this moment, empowering students to see something. And, and once they feel connected to a community, they will feel empowered to go forth and make a change and, and want to rally to do something. I had a group of students rally around saving a local uh, lake that was up for sale and they were able to help support the purchase of that lake by a land trust and it's our newest state park in Colorado. And by allowing students to feel that connection to their community and allow them to have that power to make that change, that wasn't something that was found in a textbook. That wasn't something that could just be repeated year after year. It was an organic moment that happened when a group of students felt like they could make a change and I was able to allow them to make that change now instead of telling them like you can make that change in five years or you can make that change when you're an adult. Our students should be able to feel empowered to make a change now because the future isn't happening for our students. Uh, life isn't happening in the future for our students. It's happening right now. And so students need to have that ability to feel that change. And when students feel connected to the place, feel connected to the land, then they feel more empowered to go forth and make a change. Thank you, Autumn. Sir? Wow. Um, so I think when it comes to, I guess, the, the, the problems of, edu of public education and indigenous knowledge, it's that's a big that's a big lift to answer quickly um i would say some of the biggest things to to look out for to be to to be mindful of is the western settler tradition likes to disembody com commodify and make transportable knowledge right and for most of our relationship with the Western tradition, it has been extractive and non-reciprocal. So we have to be mindful of the relationships that we go into, the way that knowledge is created, co-created, and distributed. Um, but I also, I also think that Western tradition that we see in public education standards has a lot of problems to unpack in itself. So who if we're trying to re-embody knowledge where is that knowledge embodied well there's a big problem with anthropocentrism within academic fields right so i i am next to alder which teaches us about community and behind this alder 
is a fur that teaches us about adaptability and at my feet are nettles, which teach us inner strength and, and, and you know, self-awareness, right? Because if you're not self-aware, nettle will remind you pretty quickly. <laughs> and, and so I think it comes down to that when we look at the way that we so often traditionally learned, we, knowledge was dependent. So we would have a person or a family or a clan that would be known for carrying this knowledge. And what was important about that was that it meant that our communities were dependent upon the knowledge that each group of people was entrusted to steward and safeguard. And so that way we could share that knowledge and we all lift each other up because every single person within that community, within that learning space has valuable knowledge and experience to share. And then we open up our hearts and our ears and our spirits to the teachings that are all around us because this is a classroom. As everyone here on this panel knows, this is a classroom. So we have to look at some worldview issues. We got to look in the mirror a little bit on an academic and public education standpoint, but the, it's totally doable because it's being done. The question is like, how is it scalable and how do we maintain the, 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 the fidelity of what we teach um, moving forward? Thank you so much, Whitney. You know, then I have a question if I can yeah. ask before yeah, we absolutely. In this. Um, so I'm my my positionality is all of, is Hawaii, and we don't use the terminology of Turtle Island very often. So I love to um, get a more robust definition of Turtle Island, if that's possible. The land, the land, yeah. the land in which we live on. Um, Mother Earth uh, is another term I could use if, if that is more suitable. Um, in my language, um, we call the land my mother, Shema. And so, um, you know, I think as Indigenous people or just people in general, we all have our old terminology um, in which we address the land. I like to, um, uh, you know, call her Turtle Island just because it, you know, it, it encompasses, I mean, when you think of how strong a turtle is and how, how amazing a turtle is, it encompasses that beauty. So yeah. I, I hope that helps a little bit. No, I appreciate that, that yeah. definition. I think that it, it really um, deepens the term when, when I hear it being used a lot more. I think because in, in Olelo Hawaii, you know, we use Aina, and Aina, again, is very synonymous, I think, to this definition of Turtle Island, that land is, is all of this, all of that is the physical land, is the water, is what thrives on it, us, and so forth. And um, I was thinking a lot about this question, about, like, what is our responsibility? And I think when I think about... <laughs> I think a lot, meta, wow, so much. But I, I wonder about how someone who may be a little bit more less connected to land, connected to Aina, may engage a, with a question such as this. It may engage with how do we use utilize land in our classrooms, in our learning, in our pedagogy. Something that I've been... I've been working on in my own head recently is that, well, I've been sitting with my, my two children this summer, watching them play video games over and over and over. <laughs> it's just a bit much. But I realized that there's some kind of analogy that is surfacing for me when I think about place and how do we engage with our places. For one, so often, so often in education, we talk about this idea of personalization that we must individualize learning for every single student in our classroom. Teachers have to become air traffic controllers and have to mitigate every single issue and, a, and, a, and um, you know, dealing with an ER doc. And, you know, we hear all these analogies towards how much teachers have to do in a classroom to ensure that every student is learning. Like Jared said, what if we just put them outside? What if we just put them in their own communities, in, in a natural resource place or even in in a um in an urban setting we'll put them in their places and said learn observe take deep observation 
think through this problem solve. And that personalization becomes personal for them, but a teacher did not do that for them. The land did, mm -hmm. the, the natural environment personalized for them. But really, we're not constructing these barriers of a classroom. We're not constructing a learning experience. We're putting, we're putting our, our children in, in places and in spaces that can teach them. And so the analogy that has kind of built up for me is that quite often US education or colonized education looks like Minecraft. You put people in a blank space and you start building blocks around them or they start building these blocks so that they are somehow um, comforted by this new structure that they have created. But really place-based education, land-based education is much more like Super Mario. You just got to be placed into it. You got to learn that the, the vine's going to take you up to the next cloud. You have to learn how to use your environment so that it shapes you. You find a mushroom, you grow from that. All these things are something that our places teach us. And it sometimes comes through um, question and answer, problem solving, um, trial and error, all these things. But our places teach us. And as teachers, if we can relinquish that control that we have to teach kids all the time, 24 seven, and we allow other places, spaces, and I know meaning their communities to teach them as well. I think that we are doing a better job at facilitation of a true education. I agree. Um, organic and authentic learning is definitely um, is more meaningful to students because it is it's a reflection of them. It's a reflection of where they come from. And I and as an educator, definitely I try to honor that with my own students. Um, even though I am an, a Navajo Indigenous woman doesn't mean that what I bring into the classroom fits in a perfect little box in, in Salt River. They're, they're, they're a different community, their culture is different. And so trying to find ways to honor that um, within the context of the classroom is something I, I do daily. I, I reflect daily. I, I think about, because we, um, we are uh, close to the Salt River, um, in the riparian basin that runs along the salt river and so uh we have you know we definitely have a program a science program that we follow however when we stepped out of, outside of that science program and took the kids into the river and they were building crayfish traps and we learned about um crayfish and 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 how and the importance of the riparian basin to the health of not only the salt river but the community as well the kids were getting dirty, you know, there was, you know, the, the, the bait for the crayfish was stinky and they were getting wet and, you know, and we went there for two days and, and it was just beautiful. It was authentic learning. And to this very day, and these kids are now in um, sixth grade and they still talk about that trip that, you know, those two days we spent along the river um, and it was meaningful, their community. I was getting really good authentic questions from them. Like, how do we protect the river? for us, for us as Salt River people. Um, it, because it's being exploited by, um, you know, people who float down the river and um, the, the riparian basin is, is not as healthy as it should be. And so they were really asking those questions about how do we protect our own resource so that, you know, it, it, it's beneficial for, for us in the future. So in indigenous communities, we talk about land back and um, and it may not be the same for everybody, but you know, the traditional stewards of this land um, were indigenous to this country, whether, um, you know, when we think about that in a historical sense. So what reconciliation practices are important to the sustainability of resources and the environment? And I'm just that's just an open question to the panel. So whoever would like to go first. I think it's important to really make sure that you just just name it. I think so many times we just sort of can overlook things and really talk about the history of the land and grounding in the land. 
uh, very similar with the Colorado River that flows through Glenwood Springs. Um, it is also uh, the the most endangered river in the United States, and it's a it's something that we need to really take care of and be good stewards of, and allowing students to see the good, the bad, and the ugly, and allow them to sort of have their own decision making behind it. I do not think it's my job as a teacher to help tell my students what to think, but it's our job to teach them how to think and allow them to make their own claims based off of the evidence that's presented in front of them. And so just making sure that students are able to see that piece, ideally out in the field where they can walk and really have their feet in the river or watch the, the storm water run right into the water after it rains with no any sort of filtration system and really process like what that must mean for the habitat and for the people downstream of us, allowing all of those pieces to happen and allowing those students to be part of it, I think is something that's really important to have them experience it and have them reflect on it, have them talk about it, all of those pieces tie in together because it is their lives too. It is where, where they are living and what they are part of and allowing them to actually have time to reflect and process that is something I think that's really key in this process. Thank you, Adam. Anybody else? I think, I think when it comes to that question, um, I always like to point out when especially when settlers say reconciliation, we, we, need to, we need to approach the conversation with caution um, because reconciliation can also just be accommodation um, in which no real substantive challenges to power or shifts in power or restoration can actually happen, right? They can still self-heal and accommodate a lot of things um, without any positive or meaningful change actually happen. So I think we need to be skeptical when we hear people coming to us with reconciliation. Um, land back for me is, it's a lot bigger than, I, I almost feel like we have to kind of explain it to like a diverse audience because um, land, like, so when a lot of people's like, oh, uh, when, especially when non, non-native people talk about decolonizing, um, I often think, do you like, because I mean, the simplest form decolonizing means land back. So like, okay, uh, well, we, we're, ha we're happy to have our lands unoccupied again, but I don't think you understand what you're saying. But for us, like land back is so much bigger. It's about, you know, it's about understanding the difference between like seated and unseated land and living in a world where your homes are occupied um where the, the 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 settler culture and governments are making decisions that are infecting that are impacting and affecting the the health and well-being of indigenous people everywhere land back i think is also about that restoring that that cultural and spiritual connection right because not only do we have a relationship with the land but you know our, our ceremonies come from there our medicine our diets our bodies evolved with the place on the earth our, the land shapes our language. Um, what we call things is often shaped by, by the environments in which we originate from. So it, it, it's, it's far greater than any sort of what people might kind of tie into some sort of reference to sort of like traditional Western locking concepts of property, right? It's not a, it's not a transference of property. It's a restoration and reattachment uh, to place. That's really important. And I think when it comes to sustainability and looking at the environment in the future, I, I'm blanking on, on the person's name that I heard that, that said this. Um, but she said the, the solution to climate change is really simple. Really simple. It's, it's, it's just, a, just a couple of words. Honor indigenous sovereignty. We didn't make this problem. We have lived in balance since time began. Um, we know how to care for these spaces. And the spaces that we do have that are safe, you know, the places where your water is clean, is because of the ongoing fights and assertion of treaty rights and sovereignty of indigenous peoples everywhere. Bring us to the table um, and let's learn to understand the, the, the bigger context of, of what's at hand because 
the solutions are there. We just have to have that common language to understand each other, I think. Oh, 100 percent. You know, when we think, you know, there's the literal sense of uh, the literal uh, definition of land back. Yeah, let's let's get our land back. But it's actually about the to me, when I think of land back, I think about the health of our, our land and our the health of our water. And, and what are we what are we sustaining? Are we going to continue on this path where, you know, uh, our water systems and our waterways and our land and, and what we grow on it and put inside our body continues to become unhealthy? Or do we revert back to those healthy practices that keep our land healthy and keep our environment healthy and keep, you know, the two-legged and four-legged and the winged animals in our environment? Um, I just saw um, on uh, my feed, um, one of my friends who is from Hawaii talking about uh, the birds along the shores of um, her homeland and how there are only like 135 of these birds left and the extinction is going, you know, they're only going to be around estimated five more years. And so, and that really made me sad. You know, land back is not just about, you know, getting literally in that sense land back. It's about the health of our, 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 system and, and how we are protecting them. So when we think about that, um, how do we take care of these lands? You know, how do we honor the traditional caretakers of the ancestral lands in which you occupy and which we occupy? How do we take care of that? And how do we um, uh, bring that alive in our classroom? Again, this is open to anyone on the panel. I, if I can, if I can start, um, I think that one thing is being very honest with students. Like it's, it's beautiful to stand outside or it's beautiful to, to be in environments that are untouched or seemingly untouched by humans um, or stewarded very well. But truth of the matter is that most Many places in, in the on the Western or what we would say the Western continent or the continental U.S. even in urban Hawaii is not is a, so different from a natural environment, and I think that ensuring that students see what humans have done to the earth is something that has to be tackled. Like we can talk about social justice all we want, but ecological justice has to be at the forefront of our conversations as well. That it's not, and it is not just one, one population that has done this. Like no matter what, we are all complicit to environmental degradation because of our life in a capitalistic economy. The, the mere fact that to see my, my colleagues, Jared or Autumn, like I have to fly on an airplane and I have to use so much carbon. I have to put so much carbon into the atmosphere just makes me so sad. But students have to engage with this, that we want to go to Disneyland and we want to go to Japan and Korea and we want to do all these things, but at what cost to the environment? And Let's, let's continue to bring in indigenous knowledge sources into our classrooms, into our conversations, into our, into our content and infuse that and make sure that they are the ones leading the conversation and not just some kind of application or think about at the end of a lesson. Like, here's what an indigenous person would say at the end or not even start it off as a quotation to begin a chapter. It is like the infusion of everything and the conversation that exists and persists for our students to ensure that they recognize their communities have value, have intelligence, knowledge for which to, to see our Earth's future forward. 
And I just echo what Whitney says. I think that's such a beautiful way of saying it, especially speaking to the ecological justice, Whitney. Thank you for raising that point, because I think that is such a crucial part. And for allowing our students to also know that that justice piece, I know when I went to school, it was saving the rainforest and in the Amazon, which is important, but I also can work on things throughout my own community and my own land and where I'm at and allowing students to feel like they can do things to better where they are here and bringing that awareness out is so important and also allowing students to do it now. They see something they want to change, allow them to start planning ways. How can I make connections with other people? Who else can we reach out to really helping support our students? Because I think they have such great energy and they can do amazing things. Um, and just bringing that idea to the forefront and then encouraging them with however they go to really help be better stewards of this amazing planet that we're living on. Thank you, Adam. Wow, um, just so much to digest. Um, I would say everyone, everyone can, can be an ally and a co-caretaker. Um, even if you live in the most densely populated urban environment, um, there's all sorts of things you can do to leave the world a better place. Um, but you can also just, if you have the, the means and the resources in whatever capacity, support indigenous environmental efforts. Um, you know, even if it's, you know, something is, you know, volunteering, um, you know, sharing on social media or you know writing a check it makes a difference um if you have the space look at your own environment um you know this um, the united states is famous for the suburb um turf is horrible for the environment <laughs> it uses an obscene amount of drinking water to to grow something that just looks green um so study the, the the ecology of your area. I think I think um, you know Autumn was really hitting on just start local. It's easy to get overwhelmed with like the global devastation, but there's things that you can do in your own community, um, in your own yard. Like what what are the native plants of your of your ecology? Reestablish those because it's not just about you. It's about for all the insects and the bacteria and the birds that need those plants that need that relationship. And you can also learn to engage and see the world differently as these plants sort of thrive in these natural spaces. Um, and I think the other thing too is look look at, I think reflect on sort of like the, what it means to gather and harvest. Um, because if, if, you're, if you're eating and gathering what you need from a plot of the earth, you're gonna have a different view on how you take care of that earth because that is going into you. Um, so find opportunities to learn more. Um, no, no participation is too small. Learn, there are fantastic books. And when in doubt, take an opportunity, get into a community, learn from it, join it, and work for a better future. Thank you so much. And the last question I would like to ask the panel is where do you go to find peace, to ground yourself, to rejuvenate, um, to, to fill your bucket, so to speak? So where do you go? Um, anywhere that there is an Aspen Grove where I can sit and listen. Um, my favorite place is an Aspen Grove. Any season, it doesn't matter. And that's what I love about them is they're so, uh, they're ever changing. And as they're all one organism, you just feel like you're part of something so much bigger. And it's such a great grounding moment to just take a breath and listen to the leaves. Thank you, Adam. Whitney, Karen? Um, for me, I go into the ocean. Um, there's a specific beach park that I go to that um, I've been swimming there nearly my entire life and I can map the corals as I swim. I know exactly what the currents are, what corals I'll see, perhaps even what fish I'll see on that path. It'll tell me like when it, the water gets colder, what happens there mm -hmm. when the water is warmer, when it's murky, where it's 
deep, all these things. And it's, it's like a map that I've had in my head my entire life that grounds me because I know exactly where I'm going, even if I'm not looking outside of the water. And so that reminds me of my na'al, like my gut and what I know I need to be doing to ensure that I'm doing right by myself and by the people that I love. Thank you. Terry? Yeah, I, I, I would have to, to echo both um, Autumn and Whitney um, on their on their sentiments. Um, yeah, any any time to just, I don't know, the world is just so noisy, distracting, intrusive. It's all about finding opportunities to to let ourselves be present with space and time and anything around us. Like just feel a breeze, you know, you know, watch the grass grow, you know, like listen, listen to the sounds of ants working together. Like, you know, we need, we need opportunities to ground ourselves um, and, and just kind of heal from that. Um, but I, I think one, one example of, of this speaking true to me was during the pandemic. It's a tough time for everybody. Um, and I remember um, I began um, visions, visions of, of, of our homelands would come to me in my dreams. And I couldn't, I couldn't shake it. And so I realized like, you know, I was being called home. And so, you know, we packed up the car and we drove, we only had a little bit of time to just like, kind of like bomb all the way down there. And, 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 and to get that healing and then drive all the way back up. We, but we fit it in because I was answering a call because the land often knows better what's best for us than we know for it. Um, and so that, that, that healing, that, that time to share was exactly what we needed. Um, and it's really just kind of given me the strength forward. And I think also just reminded me of the importance of being open to what the land is telling us. Thank you so much. I definitely, you know, find peace and ground myself and rejuvenate every time I go home. And when I talk about home, I'm talking about uh, where I grew up in my parents' home in Northern Arizona. Uh, I, I get the worst cell reception, so I can't use my cell phone, uh, which is a good thing. Um, you know, my parents are, they have no technology in their home. And, you know, they sit outside in the evening to watch the sunset every single day. Um, and it's quiet. And it's like stepping back in time. And, and, and the smell, the, the food that I eat, the, the red sand that I walk on, all of those things um, is where I find peace. I ground myself and um, definitely rejuvenate. Um, I'm not Really, I think we're coming close to the end of our session here. And, you know, all of us as educators, um, wherever we are um, on Turtle Island, we are all caretakers of the, of the communities and of the land in which we are walking upon. Um, you know, one of the things that I've noticed a trend in is definitely land acknowledgement. And I have a love-hate relationship with land acknowledgments because it can just be a regurgitation of, of what, you know, what everybody's doing, what the trend is. But um, I think if we are really going to do land acknowledgments, then we really need to be stewards of the land in which we reside on and, with, and where we teach in. That, to me, is truly uh, the essence of, of true land acknowledgement. Um, I got a, a text early this morning from Juliana uh, Ertebe, the, the 2021 National Teacher of the Year, and she said she's here in this session, So, and she texted me this morning. She's like, I'm so excited I get to see in your session, but I have a quote from her, uh, which truly resonates for all of us, and that everybody plays a critical role in ensuring our children and families are seen, embraced, welcome, and that their strengths are uplifted. And this truly resonates to um, where we teach and the communities in which we teach and, and how we are going to bring that community into our classroom. 
So with that, does anybody have any final words they'd like to share with the audience? Final thoughts? No, but thank you for having us today. It was great to talk with all of you. I appreciate just having a, a moment to really discuss this. Thank you, Lynette. Thank you, Ada. Yeah, thank you everyone for your, your time and attention. And um, I hope I hope you get a walk away with, with something valuable today. Mahalo kako. Um, if you ever wanna have deeper conversations with any of us, I think that we are available. You can find us online and aloha. Thank you so much.